the non-accidental trauma evaluation, how to get it right. When we start talking about inflicted injury in children, it's important for us to think about this the same way that we think about other things in emergency medicine. So for example, emergency medicine physicians spend a lot of time during training and in continuing medical education learning about things like acute coronary syndrome and pulmonary embolism. And why is that? Well, it's because these are diseases that we don't want to miss. We miss them and people die. And in fact, as a general rule, we've gotten pretty good at it. Our miss rates for acute myocardial infarction nationally are about 2%, 5% or so for PE. What may be surprising, however, to many clinicians is that our miss rates for non-accidental trauma is estimated to be 30% or more. And unfortunately, the consequences of these misses are catastrophic, with mortality as high as 10% for these children. So this is kind of a big deal. In a study of 44 children who died from inflicted injuries, almost 20% were seen by a physician for an acute care visit within one month of their death. The vast majority of these were seen in emergency departments, and they complained of things like facial bruising on arrival. At autopsy, more than half had fractures in multiple stages of healing, consistent with previous abuse, suggesting that had we done more of an evaluation earlier, we could have potentially saved the lives of these children. For those reasons, we're going to spend some time today talking about how we can identify injury and illness patterns that should make us suspicious for inflicted injury in children. We'll utilize a few new decision rules that can help us with that process. We'll talk about what our ultimate evaluations need to look like when we suspect abuse in these kids, and we'll challenge some common misconceptions along the way. This is the talk we're not going to have. You don't need to hear about coining. You don't need to hear about sparing patterns and burn injuries. You've all had that talk before. You've had it 30 times. These aren't the cases that we struggle with. Instead, we're going to focus on the kinds of cases that make us really uncomfortable, the ones that make us hem and haw because we think maybe there's something we should be paying attention to, something we should be doing, but we are not sure what. Cases like this one. Four-month-old with fever to 1017 cough and congestion clinically looks like she's got pneumonia, but overall she looks pretty good, except that on exam she has a bruise roughly the diameter of a pencil eraser right on her left lateral chest wall. What do you do with that? Do you get studies? Do you get social work? Do you scan her from head to toe? Unfortunately, child abuse is common. In the U.S., in 2010, 1,560 children died from abuse and neglect. Almost 800,000 were victims of abuse and neglect. And if that's not enough for you, in children under four years of age, inflicted trauma was the leading cause of traumatic death. And when you consider that trauma overall is the leading cause of death in children ages 1 to 14, this is a pretty big deal. We're not talking about sepsis. We're not talking about asthma. We're talking about children who are dying because people are hurting them. And it seems to me that as providers on the front lines of care, we ought to make recognizing it a priority. And being good at recognizing it means that we need to recognize patterns. Just like we spend time learning to recognize patterns of injury on EKGs, just like that's a priority and a focus of our education, there are patterns that we need to recognize in abusive injury in children. So let's move on to a case. Two and a half month old with clinical bronchiolitis and increased work of breathing. On review of systems, the family says that the kid bruises pretty easily, and on exam, there's a faint bruise on the right hand and the left anterior shin. What do we do with this? Do we get labs? Do we get imaging studies? And if so, of what? Do we involve social work? So this is a case from the literature from a case series that was reported, and this is actually what happened. The child was admitted for bronchiolitis. They got coags, and they were normal. The child was released to home with plans for follow-up with the primary care physician for further evaluation of this easy bruising diagnosis, but unfortunately never made it there because she died from inflicted injuries first. At autopsy, there were old and new fractures that were consistent with previous abuse, suggesting that maybe we could have picked this up sooner. So in retrospect, this is a missed abuse case with lethal repercussions. But the question we really need to answer, the question we all want to know, is this. Could we have known sooner? Were there indications that this child specifically needed more of an evaluation? When we start talking about patterns that we as clinicians need to recognize, at the very top of that list is bruising. Bruises are the most common sign of maltreatment in kids. They are often the first sign that abuse is ongoing, and it's missed as an indication of abuse in up to 44% of fatal and severe cases. But kids get bruised all the time. So how do we tell the difference between bruises that should make us worry and those that probably aren't a big deal?
The good news is that there's a lot of research out there to help us risk stratify these kids and help us decide what we need to do next. This is my favorite study. They took 973 well kids under the age of three who were going to their pediatrician for well child care. And here's what they did. They documented if the child had any bruising, and they documented where, and that's it. And here's what they found. In children under six months of age, 0.6% had any bruising anywhere on their bodies. When they bumped it up to nine months of age, 1.7%. There was rarely any trunk bruising. There was no bruising on the hands or buttocks. It wasn't until kids were mobile, till they started cruising or walking, that they started getting bruising at all. And in those cases, it was still mostly on the anterior shin, knee, and forehead. And the take-home message is that kids who aren't mobile, kids who aren't cruising or walking, very rarely bruise. This is a systematic review of 23 articles looking at bruising patterns and abuse, and it echoes many of the same things. Suspicious bruising patterns in kids include bruising in children who are not independently mobile, bruising in babies, bruising away from bony prominences like the face, back, abdomen, arms, and ears. But even with all of this, the thing that would make all of this decision making a bit easier is if we had some sort of clinical decision rule, like the Canadian C-spine rule or the PERC rule for pulmonary embolism. Unfortunately, we don't quite have that, but we do have a clinical decision rule that's been derived. It's called the 10-4 rule. It is yet to be prospectively validated, but the derivation study is pretty compelling. Here's how the 10-4 rule works. Any bruising in a suspicious body region in a child less than four years of age requires further evaluation. And the suspicious body region is defined by the 10 part of the rule, where T stands for torso, which includes the chest, back, buttock, GU, and hip regions, E stands for ears, and N stands for neck. So bruising in that 10 region in a child under 4 requires further evaluation. In addition, any bruising in a child under 4 months of age requires evaluation. In the derivation study, they had a sensitivity of 97% and a specificity of 84%. So not yet prospectively validated, but fairly compelling and seems to echo what we already know about bruising in kids. Certainly something to consider. So let's summarize bruising. There are patterns that we need to be really good at recognizing and comfortable acting upon. In retrospect, for this child, we had some red flags. We had a non-ambulatory infant, age under four months, bruising to the hand, and a very poor history that was offered. In retrospect, this child deserved more of an evaluation, and we potentially could have saved this child's life. Now, a quick warning before we move on to please not attempt to date bruises. There's loads of evidence saying that we cannot accurately date bruises, and offering up any estimates may muddy things for law enforcement and prosecution. So if you are asked to date bruises, please explain that this can't be done accurately and politely say no. Okay, let's move on to another case. A non ambulatory eight-month-old with swelling to his right thigh and refusal to bear weight when his parents hold him to stand. Dad reports falling on the stairs while holding the child, and the x-ray reveals a transverse fracture of the femur. What do we think about this case? Well, most practitioners are concerned about this child as we've all been taught that long bone fractures in non-ambulatory children are abuse until proven otherwise. And there is some truth to that, as we will soon see. But here's what actually happened in this case. So dad on history gives a very clear description of holding the child in his right arm, twisting and falling and landing on the child briefly before they both tumbled down the stairs together. And in fact, it happened in a public venue. There were five nonpartisan witnesses, including the security officer, who called 911. So in this case, we have a clearly established accidental injury, but that's not usually the story we get, right? Usually it's adult, alone with child, with an injury that is concerning. So the question we have to answer now is, one, how could we have established that this was accidental, even in the absence of nonpartisan witnesses? And two, what fracture patterns are predictive of abuse versus accidental trauma? When we start talking about patterns in abuse in children after bruises, we need to be comfortable with fractures. Fractures are the second most common indication of ongoing abuse of injury, and the risk of subsequent abuse and mortality is quite high. Unfortunately, no fracture on its own can distinguish an abusive from a non-abusive cause, and that means that we need to be thoughtful about this and really be detectives. We need to consider things like the type of fracture. Is it spiral? Is it transverse? Is it comminuted? Where the fracture is? Is it the ribs? Is it the femur? the developmental stage of the child, the history that's offered, and whether or not there's been any delay in seeking care. <laughs>
There are some patterns that are more suggestive of abuse. In general, abusive injuries occur in children who are younger than three years of age, with the most of them happening in children that are less than 18 months. The younger the child is, the more likely it is to be an abusive injury. There is also a significant association between the number of fractures and abuse. So if you see more than one fracture, you need to be suspicious. Or if you see fracture in another injury, like a belly injury or a head injury, you need to be suspicious, especially in the absence of a very compelling trauma history, like a motor vehicle collision. There are some fractures that all by themselves should make us worry. Rib fractures are at the very top of that list. In a child under a year of age, rib fractures are almost always abusive, and they are not caused by CPR. In addition to rib fractures are corner fractures, also called bucket handle fractures or classic metaphyseal lesions. And this is a picture right here. It occurs from forceful pulling or yanking on a child and is virtually pathognomonic for abusive injury. You can see this fracture as a lucency right here. You need to look very carefully to identify these fractures, but if you do see them, you need to be very, very worried for inflicted injury, and that child certainly requires more of an evaluation. Any fracture in a non-ambulatory child is concerning, and in fact, in kids under one, long bone fractures are abuse in 40 to 80% of cases. But it's important to keep in mind that that means that in the rest of cases, it is truly an accidental injury. This is something we always need to be cognizant of when interacting with these caregivers. Buckle fractures are something we don't think twice about in children. It's so very, very common. Children fall, they land on an outstretched hand, and they develop a buckle fracture. But it's important to keep in mind that the fall on the outstretched hand is a protective reflex that only occurs as children get older. So in young kids, particularly children under nine months of age, this is not yet developed, which means that buckle fractures in this age group are concerning. Multiple fractures or injuries, as we've already discussed, in a child without a compelling mechanism should also make us concerned. Femur fractures are very often abuse, as you all knew. In fact, in kids who are non-ambulatory, it's abuse 80% of the time. Once they start walking, it drops to about a third of the time. In non-inflicted injury, it is typically an isolated injury. And there are a lot of studies that have been done looking at injury plausibility models, trying to sort out which femur fractures are abuse and which aren't. Unfortunately, any fracture can fall into either category. So you may have a child with a spiral fracture that is not abusive and a buckle fracture that is abusive. What matters is that the history and mechanism has to match the fracture that you see. So if you see a child with a common uterine femur fracture, they better have a high energy mechanism to match that injury. And that means that we actually have to take careful histories. So for example, not enough to say Johnny fell down the stairs. You've got to ask in a little bit more detail. Well, what was Johnny's position when he fell? What did the fall look like, or how did he land? Or what position did you find him in? In studies looking at this and looking at plausibility in kids with accidental stair falls and injuries, the caregiver could almost always give a very graphic description of, at a minimum, how the child fell or the position that he landed in. And often, they could give details about the rest. The vaguer the history, the more suspicious you need to be about abuse. Now, unfortunately, when it comes to fractures, we don't have a decision rule. There's no perk type rule here for us, but there are some good guidelines that can help us. If you answer yes to any of these questions, more of an evaluation is warranted. One, is this an unusual or highly suspicious fracture like a corner fracture or a rib fracture? Two, is a child less than one or non-ambulatory? Three, is the story vague or downright implausible? Four, is there more than one fracture or other associated injuries? Five, are there concerning bruising patterns? Yes to any of these, and more of an evaluation is warranted. So bottom line for this case, accidental but clearly suspicious injury. Ways in which we can try and tease that out is one, to make sure that we understand the common mechanisms of injury, and two, that we make sure that we recognize high-risk fractures and patterns and that we look out for any mismatches between the history and fracture that we see. We're going to change focus here just a little bit. So we've spent some time talking about patterns that we need to recognize, bruising and fractures, because they're the most common initial red flags we'll see. Now we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about occult injuries in these kids and how that may help us understand why the recommended evaluation for these children when we're suspicious for abuse is what it is. So here's our next case. 
This is a three-month-old that is brought in by Child Protective Services for evaluation because her twin sibling is being evaluated for rib fractures that are suspicious for inflicted injury. So Child Protective Services wants this kid checked out as well. And on exam, the child looks marvelous, awake, alert, not a mark on her, doing all the things that a thriving three-month-old should. What do you do with this child? Do you get a skeletal survey? Do you get a head CT? Do you get labs? Do you call social work? Do you admit for observation? So here's what actually happened with this child. CPS actually requested that a head CT and skeletal survey be performed, but the physician evaluating the child felt that those tests were inappropriate for the child and really not warranted given her clinical exam. He thought it was a lot of radiation for a child with a normal exam and so declined to order those studies. The child was brought to another facility where those tests were ordered, and here's what they found. Multiple rib fractures. These are arrows pointing to just a few of them and subacute on chronic subdurals. Again, this is a three-month-old that looked like a champ without a mark on her. So some questions we need to answer. First, what is the appropriate approach to the evaluation of siblings of children with inflicted injury? And second, how can we exclude abusive head trauma? Do we have to CT all of these kids? Let's talk about siblings first. This is a good reminder to us to always remember to ask about other kids in the household. If you're looking at a kid and you're worried about abuse, you need to make sure that there's no other child in the home that may be at risk. Second, the AAP is pretty clear about their recommendation that any sibling of a child with injuries concerning for abuse requires evaluation. Now, they won't all require a head CT and a skull survey. That will depend on how old they are and what their physical evaluation reveals. But they all require an evaluation. The evidence is even more compelling that if one twin is being injured, the other is likely to be injured as well. Okay, let's talk about abusive head trauma. Head injury is the leading cause of death from inflicted trauma and is estimated to occur in as many as 1 in 3,300 kids under a year of age. This makes it more common than cancer in this age group. More than 50% have no external evidence of trauma, so no bruising about the face or neck, and many of them are asymptomatic or have nonspecific symptoms like maybe a little bit of increased fussiness or maybe they're not sleeping well or having some vomiting. In studies looking at abusive head trauma that we've missed, we miss it about 31% of the time. And the diagnoses that we give these kids includes things like meningitis, bruising of unknown origin, increasing head size, seizure disorder, and so forth. In another study that looked at the incidence of occult head injury in children undergoing evaluation of inflicted trauma, here's what they found. 30% had intracranial injury. So these were kids that were undergoing evaluation because they had bruising that was funny, or they had a lot of fractures that were unexpected, or they had burns that were concerning. So they got a head CT as part of their evaluation, but they looked well otherwise. They had a normal neuro exam and no bruising about the face or the neck. 30% of these kids had injury identified by CT. Because of that, because the incidence is high, because missing it is lethal, and because many present occultly, the recommendation for the evaluation is pretty aggressive. And here's what it is. In kids under 12 months of age, if you suspect abuse, they get a head CT. Once they get to 13 months of age, there's a little more leeway. It's a little bit more clinically based. If you see any external signs or have reason to suspect, then CT those kids. But in children under 12 months, if you suspect abuse, they get a head CT. A quick word about radiation apprehension because we've all been told we're radiating too many kids. We need to stop. We're giving them all cancer. And that's true. There are a lot of arenas in which we really need to rein our imaging in. This is not that scenario. Keep in mind that for occult injury, our positive rate is 30%. And when we miss it, the consequences are catastrophic, up to 80% mortality in one study. So our threshold needs to be low. This is your permission slip to scan them. So bottom line for this, normal neuro exam doesn't exclude anything in these kids. Miss rates are high. You need to get a CT when you suspect non xl trauma in these children. Okay, let's finish up by tying all of this together. We're going to go back to the very first uncomfortable case, the four-month-old with clinical diagnosis of pneumonia and a very small bruise overlying her ribcage. So based on what we've already discussed today regarding bruising in children, it's clear that this child deserves more of a workup. So what does that look like? In this case, a skeletal survey and a head CT were ordered, and here's what we found. 
Because of all these injuries, we sent off lab work, including a CBC, a CMP, and a lipase. She had significant anemia, and her transaminases were sky high, so we ordered a belly CT. Here's what it showed. A grade 3 liver laceration, and by the way, her pneumonia was a hemothorax. This is a child who looked well overall, was drinking from a bottle, smiling on mom's lap. You could push on her belly all day long. Grade 3 liver lac, multiple bone fractures. So we did a good job, all of us. We had our red flag of bruising, we did the right thing, and her full evaluation revealed multiple life-threatening injuries, including abusive abdominal trauma. So our last two questions of the day, how do we screen for abusive abdominal trauma? Because certainly we're not getting abdominal CTs on all these kids. And what, at the end of the day, is the standard of care for the evaluation of a child when our clinical exam raises concerns for abuse? Abuse of abdominal trauma is the second leading cause of death and in inflicted injury in children, but its incidence is incredibly low, in some studies as low as 1%. Unfortunately, a lot of these kids look great. Bruising to the abdominal wall may be absent in as many as 80% of children, and even in kids with lethal abdominal trauma, there may be no external evidence of injury. The presentation when they are symptomatic is often nonspecific, with vague abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting being the more common complaints. It can be fully occult in up to 5% of toddlers, and the mortality, unfortunately, is quite high, thought to be largely because of delays in seeking care. So because the incidence is low, the recommendation is not that we CT all these kids, and that's a good thing. Ultrasound, though, is too insensitive, so we need something else. The recommendations for what we can do for screening aren't terrific, but it's the best we've got. Here's what it boils down to. Get some labs. Get your trauma panel labs, CBC, LFTs, lipase. If the ALT or AST are greater than 80 international units, the child needs an abdominal CT. Now you can see that those sensitivities and specificities are not fantastic, but for now, this is the best we've got. 80 may seem low, especially with respect to numbers that we've been used to in the evaluation for accidental trauma, but it's a number that needs to be used in these cases. In addition, if you have concerns about intra-abdominal trauma for other reasons, like the child won't stop vomiting, the abdomen is tender, or there are marks on the belly, the child needs a belly CT regardless of the lab results. Okay, let's tie all this up. There are a lot of consensus statements by the AAP and others telling us what our evaluation must look like in these children. They're all based on a lot of the things that we've talked about today. The incidence of occult injury, the number of children who are injured, the ways in which they present, and you'll see that the evaluation is fairly aggressive, but hopefully now we all understand why. Here's what the recommendations are. Number one, all children under the age of two who present with features that make you concerned that they may be victims of inflicted injury need a full skeletal survey. All of them. And a skeletal survey is not a baby gram. It is a very well-defined 20-image protocol designed to identify injury. Some of these injuries may not be clinically important, but they are all forensically important, and their identification may be the thing that saves the child's life. So you have to make sure that you're getting the right study. After that, the workup is very age-dependent. In children under 12 months of age, all of them get the skeletal survey. All of them get a head CT, as we've already discussed. All children with identified head trauma require a fundoscopic exam by the ophthalmologist. After that, it's a little bit more variable. Some folks recommend getting labs on all of these children, CBC, LFTs, lipase, at the outset. Some folks recommend only getting these labs if there are other positive findings or if the child is just riddled with bruises or burns that are worrisome. Abdominal CT for clinical concern or for elevated transaminases. In children 13 to 24 months, they all get a skeletal survey. Everything else is based on a clinical exam. 25 months and older, it's all based on your clinical exam. These children very, very rarely require a skeletal survey. So let's summarize all this. It's been a lot of information in a pretty brief period of time. Abuse is common and commonly missed. We need to be aware of bruising in any child who presents for care regardless of the reason. Keep in mind that most children will not show up with a t-shirt that says, hey, mom or dad is hitting me. They'll show up with bronchiolitis. They'll show up with gastroenteritis. And when we are skillful in our evaluation and we identify a bruise that doesn't belong, we need to be comfortable evaluating it. Keep in mind that all fracture types occur in both abuse and accidental trauma. Be aware of highly suspicious fractures like rib fractures or corner fractures. Make sure the history offered matches the fracture you see.
Inflicted head injury is common, lethal, often occult with nonspecific symptoms, all of which means that in kids 12 months and under, if you have suspicions, they get a head CT. Don't forget to ask about and evaluate other children in the home. Last but not least, the standard evaluation in infants with suspicion for abuse, head CT, skeletal survey, retinal exam in the setting of identified head trauma, plus or minus screening labs and abdominal CT. Standard evaluation in children 13 to 24 months, skeletal survey, plus or minus, all the rest. If you have concerns or suspicions about abusive injury, please remember to call Indiana's Child Protective Services at 1-800-800-5556.